Good afternoon. Welcome to our regularly scheduled enterprise committee. My name is Lene Palmasano and I chair this committee. I'm here in chambers this afternoon, including with my committee members, uh, council members Goodman, Cano, and Fletcher. We are a quorum of this committee and are authorized to conduct our regular business. Um, colleagues and guests before you today, there's an, three, there's a consent agenda item that is short, and then we have a few discussion items. Um, I anticipate we might take about 45 minutes today for those interested. I will run through the consent agenda first and see if anyone has any questions. The first item on the agenda is a gift acceptance from Cleveland State University for Smart Cities Surveillance and Privacy Conference. For those interested, um, this is um, airfare and hotel expenses to send J.P. Heisel from city staff to this conference. Item number two is the contract amendment with Ellie May for loan administration software services. Um, my understanding is this came through HPD committee to this committee. So would anybody like to remove either of these items or have other questions? Seeing none, oh, sorry, uh, Council Member Goodman. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. This did get walked on to housing policy, so it wasn't discussed. I'm wondering if an auto renewal clause is being added to this contract or it's being eliminated from the contract? That's a good question. Um, I'll invite up someone from IT to clarify. Councilmember Goodman, uh, Chairwoman Palmasano, I'm Naren Sihavong. I can speak on behalf of that contract. Please do. It is being added uh, as an automatic renewal, but our contract, uh, this wow. is, we've completed the second year of it and we have yearly renewals for the next three years and we'll be tracking the renewal process and there's a 30 day window to to cancel or renew on, on our end too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, all those in favor of both consent items, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Those items carry. Next we have our coordinator monthly update, but I did want to ask our interim coordinator, Director Ruff, to um, help us start with the Federal Reserve update first. Sure. So welcome. <clears throat> Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm going to introduce Renee Youngs, who's going to lead us through the discussion on the Federal Reserve study and then can do an update afterwards. So Renee. Great. Welcome, Renee. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Chair Palmazano, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Renee Youngs. I'm the Policy and Research Management Analyst in the City Coordinator's Office, and I have the good fortune of shepherding this, uh, this contract process for, for the time being. Uh, I'm going to be spending a few minutes today giving you first a brief refresher on this project overall and some context and background, and then some updates on what has happened since the last time our colleagues at the Federal Reserve Bank were last before you in, I believe, September of last year. Thank uh, you. Just to acknowledge people in the room, I didn't see you before, but Dr. Anusha Nath is here from the Federal Reserve joining us today. Welcome. So uh, this, this background you, sh you should all know well. Uh, this, this study was precipitated by the passing of a minimum wage ordinance to increase the minimum wage over time, and the city has contracted with the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis to do an economic impact study on the effects of this ordinance as it begins to take effect. There we go. Uh, no, too far. Uh, the first part of this contract was a baseline study that the Federal Reserve Bank completed and delivered to the city in 2018 using historical data. Uh, we, uh, the study looked at uh, some trends overall in a number of key conditions. Uh, it dove a little bit deeper to look at those same trends by industry and also looked at characteristics of workers in the city's workforce to try and get a sense of sort of what the status quo was prior to the implementation of the minimum wage ordinance. And from there forward, uh, we will be uh, having the Federal Reserve Bank look annually uh, at data that builds on that baseline um, by taking the, the trends that we, or 
looking for, identifying trends in a series of questions we care about in relation to economic impact uh, and how those things might uh, diverge from an otherwise expected status quo uh, in sort of a world absent an increasing minimum wage, uh, as well as getting a, an increasingly clear sense of who would be, will be, or is being affected by changes to the minimum wage and how. Uh, so the particular areas of impact will focus on uh, potential effects on workers, potential effects on firms where workers are employed, and potential effects on consumers, uh, the extent to which and if any of those uh, areas are, are seeing effects as a result of the increasing wage over time. So the anticipated impact of the study itself is really to be something that is particularly comprehensive and in that respect quite unique among other studies of minimum wage increases or uh, the effects of wages in a, in a municipality. Um, and that is because of using particularly unique and particularly comprehensive data sets. And my understanding is that uh, everyone who was a part of, <clears throat> excuse me, bringing this study to, to fruition uh, is really anticipating some uh, exciting and particularly uh, deep and informative uh, data that will inform policy uh, both here in Minnesota and elsewhere because there isn't a comparably in-depth study taking place in any other municipality. So to do that, uh, there are three big categories of data sources that are coming from other public sector entities, particularly from state agencies. Uh, there is, will be data coming from Minnesota's Department of, of uh, Employment and Economic Development, and that data will generally uh, tell us about how much workers are earning and from what employer. So for instance, are working, workers earning more overall, or are they facing reduced hours and needing to pick up additional employment to uh, have a comparable overall income? That kind of data. Um, <clears throat> data from the Department of Human Services will tell us about whether workers are accessing public benefits more or differently. Uh, so for instance, are more workers being laid off because of effects on firms? Um, <clears throat> or do workers earn um, more, is there a benefit cliff situation, right? Are, as workers earn more, do they lose access to public assistance that they may otherwise be taking advantage of? Uh, and then the third big data set, <clears throat> excuse me again, is data from the state's Department of Revenue that will tell us about firms' payroll costs and the extent to which those may be changing, uh, and particularly how those payroll costs compare to their revenue or sales. So for instance, are businesses' profit margins tighter because of effects of an increasing minimum wage? Um, so you can see sort of a picture of some really interesting questions to explore beginning to emerge by talking about the depth and detail of data sources that, that this study will be accessing. <clears throat> so, the process since last fall. Um, the Federal Reserve Bank has successfully negotiated with these state agencies, uh, at least on a preliminary basis, to allow the Federal Reserve Bank to host data on site at their location uh, and to merge together data that has been de-identified even at the individual level to be able to look at relationships between these data sets. Uh, and that's really, really exciting. Uh, that's, that, that is the part, that granularity and interconnection of data is the thing that makes this study, in, in my non-expert opinion at least, uh, particularly exciting and energizing and valuable from a policy perspective. Uh, so, that has been the bulk of the prog progress since the last time you heard about this project, is the, the diligent and complicated work of doing this negotiation, and particularly figuring out what type of uh, security and infrastructure was needed to host and work with these data sets in a way that was compliant with statute in some cases, compliant with the state agency's policies in a lot of other cases, and was just a a best practice for the sensitivity of the data that's being used because, again, it, it drills all the way down in many cases to the level of individual residents. Um, I can go into more detail if you'd like about what types of 
requirements have been negotiated there, but I will spare you the, the details uh, unless anyone is terribly curious. Um, so the status of those data sharing agreements at the three agencies, uh, the agreement with DEED is, is currently, I, I believe, literally perhaps as we speak, in the process of being ex executed after all of that negotiation. That's very exciting. Uh, agreements with the Department of Human Services and the Department of Revenue are pending. Um, this is the really important and really critical first step of this entire research process because of all of the infrastructure and security needs that I just mentioned. So um, bottom line, accessing these data has been, I think, more difficult and more time consuming than uh, perhaps anyone involved I will look over my shoulder at Dr. Nath to confirm that. Perhaps anyone involved uh, anticipated at the outset of the project, but uh, progress, progress is being made. Um, so uh, we have, we have uh, I should not say we, I say our, our esteemed colleagues at the Federal Reserve Bank have done this hard work uh, and are on the precipice of finally accessing data and being able to do the actual analysis work uh, that they are uh, really excited to do, um, and to the best of their knowledge and mine uh, right now, there are no other major obstacles that they anticipate from this point forward once they have access to the data uh, to completing the work. So that, that is where we have gone so far in terms of data sharing. Looking forward to that very exciting analysis piece, uh, their, uh, their plan is to have uh, the result of those executed data sharing agreements be data in hand and ready for analysis uh, late in the spring. I believe there's a window of 60 days uh, to obtain data once the various data sharing agreements are fully executed. So that's why there's a little bit of a lag time there. Um, and then uh, the research team uh, has, has told me that their expected and hoped for window for analysis time is about six months. Uh, so that's why you see here uh, report delivery date of November 2020. Uh, because of these delays in accessing data and executing on data sharing, uh, we have worked with the Federal Reserve Bank to confirm that they will be providing the uh, I, what one might describe now as last year's, a year one report and a year two report concurrently this fall. So we will still have the two years of data set and analysis to grapple with and to make sense of, but it will all come together because of this unforeseen delay in the process to date. Uh, and in between, to try and build some narrative richness into uh, what would otherwise be primarily uh, administrative and quantitative data analysis, uh, Federal Reserve uh, Bank staff are also going to be doing some focus group or listening sessions with uh, workers and employers around the city to get a sense of the lived experience of people who are having some effect on their lives as a result of the minimum wage increase. Um, and they, they've asked me to mention to you all uh, that if, if uh, any members of this committee or any of your, your colleagues on the council uh, have input to give particularly on the geographic locations where those focus groups or listening sessions might be held, uh, that they would welcome that input, and they've asked me to be the receptacle for that input to then pass from you all and your staff onto them. And that, that is a thing that can happen offline or I suppose now if you, as, as you wish. Um, and then the end of this current contract with the Federal Reserve Bank, there will be a year three report for the subsequent year of data that will be delivered to the city uh, at the end of, or toward the end of, in the fall of 2021. Um, from there, and, and inclusive of that reporting, uh, there is uh, a sort of general plan to do some dissemination of these results. We anticipate that there will be a demand for dissemination of these results widely. Um, it is beyond the scope of my knowledge if there's a particular communication or dissemination strategy beyond what I know the Federal Reserve Bank is planning, which is to disseminate uh, through conferences and convenings of their research colleagues. Um, but I know that it's something that my, my colleagues in the coordinator's office are, are thinking about and beginning to plan. So that, that's an item uh, on which we can all stay tuned. 
Um, so that that concludes my update. I'm happy to stand for questions or comments or anything else you'd like, or if you have questions for Dr. Ness, I can turn it over to her. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? I'm not seeing any. Um, but I, I do have a question for Dr. Nath. Um, for those that don't maybe remember, Dr. Anusha Nath was one of the three principal investigators in this. Um, and municipal minimum wage was a, it was a big consideration when we embarked on this policy a few years ago, the idea of going it alone, right? And without other partners in the region. Uh, these things are usually more effective when we have more people in, and so we were thrilled when St. Paul also joined us um, in this endeavor, and even more excited when the Federal Reserve also chose to offer this type of analysis to them. So um, I guess, Dr. Nath, I'm just curious if um, we've had some hiccups here in the beginning in getting access to information. As we clear the path for doing this work with Minneapolis, does that then also clear the path for the same kind of analysis in St. Paul? And um, I, I guess I'm, I'm curious how it's going because we should be curious about it from a regional lens. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so yes, we have uh, entered into a contract with St. Paul as well. Uh, we've entered into a long-term contract till 2028 to give yearly impact evaluations for their city uh, coordinator's office as well. Uh, we will be using the same data. Uh, primarily because the methodology of evaluation would be very similar. Yeah. We would be constructing counterfactuals using data from other cities around the state. And given the granularity of the data uh, and, and the, how disaggregated it is, we would be able to do that for both Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, with the same data set. And so we would, uh, the contracts with the three state agencies do mention both the city of Minneapolis and city of St. Paul and any other city that might have uh, a minimum wage law in the future or an ordinance passed in the future, we would be uh, happy to evaluate that as well. Mm -hmm. Given the time it has taken to execute these contracts, just makes sense to kind of uh, yeah. do a bigger analysis. Super, and I'm sure that we will, as we get a report, be interested in sharing it with colleagues. A lot of my colleagues go to um, regional and national conferences, some of them this weekend or next week to National League of Cities. And, you know, in the future when we have those reports would be one voice to bring in to share uh, about how minimum wage has impacted the Twin Cities um, in the future. So. Not seeing any other questions or comments from my colleagues. So I want to thank you for being here, Dr. Nath. Thank you, Dr. Um, and thank you for the update, Renee Young. Um, thanks very much. Mr. Ruff. Chair Palmasano, members of the committee, uh, Danielle uh, was uh, not able to be here today due to a, a family issue, but I'm going to give you just a couple of short updates from coordinator office uh, perspective and certainly happy to hear any suggestions or questions. Uh, the first obviously is around coronavirus, COVID-19. Um, we are spending a fair amount of time, not trying to let it occupy all of our time, but a fair amount of time thinking about what the direction that other cities, not just in this country, but in other parts of the world are taking in dealing with this, what I think generally could be um, an emerging pandemic as a proper term. Um, clearly the state of Minnesota sets the tone and, the, um, and dictates what happens from a Minnesota Department of Health perspective that then our health department also takes the lead on. But um, Commissioner of Health also offered to be here today, but I indicated that we would probably focus more today just on the internal side of this um, emerging issue as opposed to the external, which the health department is uh, primarily focused on. But I know you can be well assured she is in constant contact with the various levels of government, including, I know, um, U.S. Senator Smith's office this morning. So on the internal side of, of reaction, I think, first of all, we want to care for our workforce, right? And we have been um, holding meetings and then have scheduled now regular conference calls among department heads on just thinking through issues of, for those people that can work from home, how do we make sure we have a proper infrastructure? How do we make sure we have the proper connections so that, such that if a decision is to made that we want to have some 
additional part of our workforce working from home that we can be equipped. And we have not made that decision yet, but that is certainly one consideration and one thing that's happening in other parts of the country. The other is we have a significant part of our workforce that can't work from home. I mean, when you're a first responder, you're not going to work from home, obviously. When you're an inspector, you're not going to work from home. So um, working through those issues as well on a department-by-department -department basis, and we are going back and looking at all of our continuity of operation plans, working with emergency management, having that communication, again, not just internally here, but at the state level, at the county level, other cities that are of our size, um, St. Paul, obviously, uh, in terms of what are they doing? And because that impacts not just our perception on what the right thing to do, but also making sure that we have consistency in our discussions with our labor partners and make sure that everyone is being treated fairly. So I think the because this is a rapidly changing and um, evolving situation, we have not set upon a certain plan, but we are coming up with options and equipping ourselves to make sure that we can react quickly when a plan is decided upon. Um, and um, I think, obviously, the, as I said, the care of our workforce and the care of our residents are, are equally important in this. And certainly um, HR is, is, is equipped to uh, talk a little bit further in future meetings, if you would like to, just about how, how they are preparing specifically. Um, we have a call again on Monday um, where we're going to go through an inventory, not just from an HR, but from an IT perspective, um, our preparation. So it's... You know, we are walking that line of being ready, um, but you know, also the message that we are not panicked. We are open for business in the classic sense of we don't want out-of-town visitors to feel like Minneapolis is not a welcoming place because we clearly are a welcoming place and want to continue moving forward. Um, but this is a critical issue, obviously, and I will just say as a side note, my daughter lives in Seattle. Um, so I'm getting, like, a couple of times a day, her, uh, her roommate is a critical care nurse in the University of Washington Hospital. So, I mean, I'm getting another perspective, and I'm sure you all are as well, on just personally what this means to people as a disruption in their lives as well. Thank you. I also I had an opportunity to speak with Director Musicant this morning. Um, I understand she was at the White House last week actually uh, talking about some of the emergency funds and how they've been used in the past and how they may or may not be able to be used to, res to respond to something new in our environment. We have a question or comment from Councilmember Cano. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to ask a question, and I totally get if it's not, if we're not ready to answer it, but I was curious. Um, so, we so we believe that the coronavirus is different than like a regular flu-like virus. So I'm, I'm trying to really discern like what what's triggering the attention. It's not that I disagree with the attention. I just want to be clear. And this is connected to likely our communication strategy, which I know we'll be discussing a little bit more today about our communications abilities. So um, so we do sense that there could be something different here in, in that it's not just like the, all the nasty flu bugs that we get every winter and our kids are sick for three, four, five days. Many of our colleagues have been sick too. So just curious, are you able to kind of share what the difference is based on conversations you've had with other city leaders or in other conversations you've been in terms of like what – why the heightened, How is this different? Why is this a, a heightened level above just a typical flu season? Mm -hmm. uh, it has to do basically with the mortality rate. I, mean, okay. I think it's 10 times the mortality rate of a regular flu. Um, okay. And so that's one. And two is, as I said, the, the state could make decisions quickly mm -hmm. about their recommendations. Um, those, you know, no surprise, that could impact schools. That could, so that has a different impact than if they make recommendations on certain age groups or certain populations that should... Um, take care to avoid more contact. Um, so those are the examples, I think, of the two rationale um, that we see. One is that mortality rate. The second is the state has indicated, and that's what happened in other places, that they may take short-term action to um, try to protect people as much as possible, and we will comply with that. And I also just wanted to add a comment. I appreciate that. It confirms some of the things that I've been looking into. I wanted to share with my colleagues here and with yourself that we did initiate um, my office as chair of the Public Safety and Emergency Management Committee, a conversation with our director of Emergency Management Services, Barrett Lane, um, to to begin to think about how we would talk about this from a, from a public safety and emergency management perspective. We're getting questions about um, not 
not saying that these are the things that would be impacted, but for example, should people be stocking up on water? Well, the city's the one that's in charge of providing clean, drinkable water. So what, what does that mean for folks who are running to the store trying to stock up on all kinds of water um, bottles? And so we're, we're getting questions about like, is the city gonna be able to provide plastic gloves and masks and um, the face masks, masks, and then questions about what would be the role of MPD in a situation where there is um, a, a sort of a larger scale impact in the city where schools close or, or um, certain employment centers aren't active. So I think it's a good topic, and I just wanted to, to say that our committee, through um, that lens of emergency management services, is looking at it. I welcome. Um, uh, the interest and, um, and participation of colleagues in, in shaping that discussion. So right now we haven't picked a date of when we would bring this to our committee, but if it makes sense to keep going down that route, or if we wanna have a more robust conversation here or at Cal, I'm, I'm open. But just so you know, we're engaging different um, arms of that, including uh, reaching out to Greta Bergstrom, who, you know, just to see how the city is communicating externally about this on our city website and and what, f what different phases that would be, as well as um, engaging our um, uh, multilingual communications arms. You know, we have a radio uh, program at La Raza. We have, um, I, I believe we might have some presence on Hmong radio as well. So there's just kind of a different layers to, to think about this. So I appreciate you working on it. And Madam Chair, Councilmember Cano, I appreciate the comments as well. I, I feel like, um, just going on and not talking about it is not an appropriate path, but I think also, um, as I said, providing the majority of our day on doing work for our residents and getting the work of government ac uh, accomplished is also an important part of what we do as well. And so I just wanted you to know that we are walking that balance. Um, second minor, uh, I shouldn't say minor, second update is, um, again, thanks to Renee uh, in the coordinator's office who is working with um, Minneapolis Police Department, we will be issuing the request for proposals for the MPD staffing and efficiency study. We expect that to be Monday. Um, and so we will send out a link when that is live so that you can distribute that. Um, but that's obviously an important component of uh, what's in front of the coordinator's office currently as well. And just wanna say that MPD is good, great partners in that, um, in that formulation of the of the request for proposals. Um, other than that, Madam Chair, I don't, I don't have any other particular updates, but again, happy to answer questions. Thank you. Any questions or further comments from my colleagues? I'm not seeing any. Um, I'll make a motion to receive and file the city coordinator's update. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? That carries. Um, next, we have Director Bergstrom uh, with an update on our community media access services for things even like this meeting and other things that we want to communicate from the city. Great, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Chair Palmasano, council members, excuse me. Uh, my name is Greta Bergstrom and I am the city's director of communications. Um, here this afternoon to provide the committee with a brief and final uh, recap of the public access TV process. Um, we're here today to seek council authorization to award a three-year contract to Be Fresh Productions uh, to operate the city's public access TV channels and to provide community media access services. Um, the three-year contract would also allow for two one-year extensions in an amount not to exceed 472000 annually. And we do understand and they understand that this is an annual budgeting process through council as well. Um, public access was last in front of uh, Enterprise Committee on September 19th um, with our partners in the coordinator's office from the Office of Performance and Innovation. Um, we had asked at that time council to approve issuance of an RFP for community, community media and public access services, um, both at the recommendation of the city attorney's office and aligning um, with practices, um, best practices for professional services um, according to city's um, policy. Um, for policy not exceeding 175,000. Um, with council authorization on October 21st, we did issue the RFP. Um, it did reflect, and we had wanted it to reflect the um, Access TV work group criteria. So that was the criteria that was brought forward in September by performance and innovation. Um, we received four submissions as of the December 9th 
due date. Um, between December and January, kind of like around the holidays and then post-holidays uh, through early February, the Community Evaluation Committee reviewed and scored each proposal and ranked each proposal against some specific criteria, again, coming out of that um, work group from the previous summer. We had five core goal areas, accessibility, engagement, content, relationship, and opportunity. And then, of course, we had four um, key areas within uh, the RFP proposal itself. So what was their work plan, um, uh, proposal and program understanding, a strategic plan, and then their overall experience and background. Pleased to say that with the highest score, um, we are moving forward in recommending uh, North Minneapolis-based Be Fresh Productions as the city's next public access contract operator. Um, I think Be Fresh really came uh, in with an impressive understanding of the city's, um, you know, what we wanted from from community media access. I think they had an, a good understanding of the city's intent to reimagine public access as a true community uh, media asset. Um, they are definitely focused on amplifying, supporting diverse voices, and, and providing innovations, both technical and otherwise training, to enhance community engagement. Um, we're working right now to develop um, a roughly three-month transition plan. We would be transitioning services from our longtime public access operator, MTN, to Be Fresh Productions. Um, we're envisioning the transition starting April 1st, 2020. We're still in discussions about that. During the transition, BeFresh um, plans to conduct a needs assessment with Minneapolis-based artists, media producers, content producers, and various stakeholders. Um, if the contract were approved by council, um, again, they would operate against a three-year contract with the option to extend um, twice uh, in one-year extensions. Um, I would like to thank our five community uh, volunteer evaluators who I can't name today, um, given the process right now. Uh, these individuals spent a great deal of personal time and attention reviewing and scoring the four proposals that the city received. Some of these proposals, as you can imagine, were in excess of 60 pages, um, and we greatly appreciate the time and care the individual spent evaluating the submissions, assigning points to the RFP criteria areas, and meeting as a group um, to discuss the merits of each proposal and really finalize recommendations. I do believe they've made a positive and significant impact um, on this process. Process. Um, lastly, but certainly not least, I would like to thank our longstanding public access provider, MTN, for their dedication over the years providing public access services and trainings within our community. Um, they really have a long legacy in the community, and it's important that we acknowledge their work over the years. Um, Chair Palmasano, council members, um, uh, if you so approve, I'd like to introduce Rebecca McDonald, who is the founder and lead director of Be Fresh Productions. She's here today with some members of her team. Um, and if you uh, approve, I would like to invite her up um, to say a few words. I think we are in agreement. That would be great. Welcome. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you, Greta, the communications department, the work group uh, who worked on the Access Television project and everyone else. Thank you, Chair Palmisano and council members. We are honored to be here today. My name is Rebecca McDonald, and I'm the founder and director of VFresh Productions. We're a media production and communications agency based in North Minneapolis. VFresh has been doing community and commercial media for over 15 years, and actually today marks the six year anniversary of founding our LLC. I am the prime contractor on the selected proposal, and I'd like to introduce my team. Nancy Smith, uh, Director of Operations. Vera Allen, Director of Communications and Partnerships. Jasmine Rue Kim of Monocat Data, our Director of Data and Impact. And our teammates that cannot be here today, Ibun Wilburn, Director of Education and David Buchanan, Director of Creative Services. Our multi-generational team has decades of experience spanning media production and training, journalism, program management, data insight and technology, and public access television. 
In fact, two of our teammates are former MTN employees. We intend to, as Greta mentioned, begin our community needs assessment process to engage with and center diverse voices. As we work to reimagine public access television as community media in Minneapolis, we will honor the history of public access television and the legacy of the current public, public access vendor, MTN. There has never been a greater need or a better time for storytelling and media makers. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Nancy, Vera, Jasmine. Thanks for also being here with us today. Are there questions or comments from my colleagues? This has been a real long process, so I appreciate Director Bergstrom's kind of reminder to us of, of where we've been and how we made these consider how we made this considered choice. Councilmember Cano. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to thank our staff, uh, Greta, who's been so thoughtful at putting this process together. Um, I was sort of in and out of the entire timeline, just uh, touching base. And um, I, I do uh, feel like this is um, a really positive direction for, for the city enterprise. I think this is such a uh, vital time to really take advantage of the dynamic field that is communications now. Um, I remember when I first started working in City Hall back in um, uh, 2010, uh, when I was an aide for then Councilmember Robert Lilligren, I, I was um, coming fresh off of organizing and, you know, the ways that we did communication was so different than the way the city did it. And I just always had this like angst about like, I wish we could do it better. And now I feel like it's getting there. I feel like you, Greta runs a really good um, shop. And I think the addition of this um, multiracial team that is uh, forward looking will certainly help us um, achieve our city goals, which are really, really important when it comes to racial justice, racial equity, engagement, um, strengthening our democracy during a time where it feels like uh, a lot of doors are, are getting shut and, and a lot of uh, really good work is getting lost in, in conflict and in, um, in lack of communication. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, this uh, new work to step up to that challenge and to provide some really exciting models that perhaps other cities can learn from. So I hope that you can also hit the conference uh, uh, circuit and, and share the word about um, the work that you'll be doing. And this here, of course, we have amazing projects like the elections, which are going to happen in November. Um, by the time I think this team gets rolling, uh, the, the census might be kind of closing up, but there's certainly um, always things that, that the city needs to do um, better engagement on and outreach on, and I think the communications department is such a, a key uh, player in, in that work. So um, thank you for uh, sticking with it and for continuing to drive that transformative work that we know is, um, is really valuable for uh, the thousands of residents we have in Minneapolis. I think that's well said. Um, I'll go ahead and move this contract and its associated terms and conditions. Are there any comments or other things council members want to say about this item? Seeing none, all those approvals say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Last but not least, the week before Sunshine Week, um, it's kind of a dreary day, Mr. Rummelhoff, to come something as sunny as this um, to council. Um, Mr. Rummelhoff will speak to what we did a staff direction on last time, which is our data practices request report and um, our effort. I, I will say at the outset, I'm really curious to the reaction of um, of this first report and how we might look to draft things better and to be more um, helpful in the future. So this is our first start. Welcome, Mr. Rummelhoff. Madam Chair and committee members. Um, so I'm Christian Rommelhoff, I'm the Assistant City Clerk, and I lead the Records and Information Man Management Division in the Clerk's Office. Uh, here with me is Kristen Olson, our Data Practices Compliance office, Officer, and uh, Casey Carl, who serves as a responsible authority. Um, so we are here responding to the staff directive from, from last time. Uh, I have some uh, uh, summary of some of the, the answers to the specific questions that were asked, but I have got a, a more in-depth presentation uh, today just kind of set the groundwork for future reports, which can be more focused and brief. But here I wanted to make sure that we had um, talked about the core concepts involved. And also I will say, to your point, we're, we are excited to make sure that this is a useful report, so any feedback is, is will be very appreciated. So the, the report is, I think, a great opportunity to uh, be transparent about our efforts to be transparent. And we can build um, 
monthly, we can build this report over time so that we have a way to look back at trends. Uh, the, the very first report is going to focus on January 2020. So in answering the questions in the staff directive, we're really focused on the questions listed here. And what was a trend in requests? And how did we as a city do in answering them? Um, and then finally, what's the status of open requests? At the end of, uh, at the end of January 31st, what did, it, what did we have in the books? What did it look like? And then we can talk about some of the factors that contribute to uh, how well we did. So the first thing I think it's important for this first time around to, to remind everyone of a, the legal context for data practices. So in Minnesota, three major laws set the, uh, uh, set the requirements for how we manage government data. The Official Records Act prescribes which government records, uh, which records the governments must make and keep. The records management statute indicates how we must manage, maintain, and dispose of these records. And finally, the Data Practices Act regulates who may access government data and under what conditions. On the slide here, you'll see the data practices piece of the puzzle is shaded into two different halves. This is to reflect that the, the law balances two different values. On the one hand, it provides access to government data to any who ask for it. But on the other, it, it requires us to protect data. So the general rule is that data is public, but there are numerous exceptions. And so our processes must ensure that we're protecting not public data. Another key concept I think that's important to understand when we talk about how requests go is to, look, to do a quick look at how we process them. So the, from a high level, when somebody makes a request, we really focus on four main stages of requests shown here. We receive the request, we retrieve the data, we review the data, and then we release the data. So it begins when somebody formally submits a request for data using a web form from the city's web page, or by calling 311, or by using the uh, police form to request police data. So once we receive it, staff works to clarify the request. We talk to the requester and to try to understand what they're looking for. Um, we work with departments and IT and other, other staff around the city to uh, locate, retrieve the, the, the data, and then we re review it sometimes in conjunction with the attorney's office or MPD, to make sure that we can identify protected data and remove it. Finally, we release it to the requester. So it's a fairly straightforward process, but things can get fairly complicated in some cases pretty quickly. So while many requests are clear and targeted, uh, or they, they target specific documents or data, others are more speculative or talk about large quantities of data. In the, in the most straightforward case, staff can simply request the data from the departments and provide it to the requester. But for complicated requests, we may need to sit down to figure out where to look. We may, this may involve a, a broad swath of the city, and if we ignore potential repositories of data, we may miss some of the important data that's been requested. But if we cast too broad of a net, we may pull back a lot of irrelevant data that we have to then spend time to review to no value. The type of data also really affects how challenging this can be. So paper files, for example, can usually only be accessed by whatever organizational principle we created in the first place. So think of a, a file cabinet organized by address. Fairly easy to look up an address. But if we want to look up building materials by their roofing type, it's almost impossible without looking at every file. Similarly, um, data such as multimedia files, uh, mobile devices, uh, structured databases that are part proprietary systems that are difficult to modify can present unique challenges. So once we have the data, we may need to review it to remove information. And here, complex reviews can involve working with the state data practices office, working with the city attorney's office, or simply reviewing every page of a large set of data. So these factors really start to determine whether how, how complex it is to respond to a specific request. But simply, a request with all the characteristics on the left-hand side of this slide will be responded to more quickly and easily with less staff time um, in processing the request. So to give context to the data that we'll be reporting, we created a model that tries to determine where a request falls on this grid of three categories here. 
So if it has a defined workflow, it's more has more of the characteristics on the left. If it's undefined, it's more more complex and more uh, more characteristics on the right. And then many requests have a mix of different characteristics and just call that in the, uh, kind of a mixed mixed bag in the middle there. So one of the focuses um, that we've been we've been uh, spending time over is uh, the last couple of years is trying to make more requests fall into that left-hand bucket. Um, so a great example came from a former clerk's office employee who noticed an uptick in requests from businesses looking to develop properties. As these came in, they, they could look very different because a developer faced with a blank form describes what they want with no prompting and it may look the same as another developer. Ultimately, they're after the same data, but they don't really have a way of talking about it uh, that allows us to act on it efficiently. So we defined a set of common responsive documents to standard requests from developers like this. Uh, and we worked with the three departments who have the data to figure out how to get it in their hands quicker. So today, when a developer wants what we now call a phase one site assessment, they send a form. Uh, departments, the three departments are automatically notified. The developer is able to immediately access some data live from our website, and the staff who uh, has to pull the other data is, is, is immediately engaged in doing so. Now, there are still challenges. Some of the data that is responsive to these requests is in paper files. But in starting to define this process, we were able to identify that as, a, as an issue and are in process of scanning those images. So we're working with environmental health to create an electronic repository, which then we'll be able to put online. So uh, the core point of this is in understanding how we're responding to the requests, we have to realize that requests vary and uh, that uh, it's worth a lot of effort to make them as simple as possible. So now to actually get to the report of how we're doing. So to answer the first question, what's the trend in requests? We're looking at requests made in January 2020. That's the blue, uh, the blue bar on the left, 199. So because we're looking at monthly numbers, it's important to know that there's going to be swings month to month. Over time, as we build up these, these reports, we'll start to see some stability in the numbers. So the, uh, as you can see, year over year, we continue to receive more requests, uh, but the rate of requests is slowing down a little bit. Um, from 2016 to 17 and 2017 to 2018, we saw about a 50 to 60% increase year over year. Last year, over last year, we saw only a 16% increase, and January is continuing that trend. So we're, we're still moving up in the number of requests we're getting, but it is starting to slow down. For me, the most notable thing on this slide is the difference in January 2020 between the requests received and closed. Historically, it's been, it's taken basically all of our efforts to get somewhere close to treading water, um, and we've often had a slight backlog being built. Uh, January, we had a significant improvement. This is uh, largely due to staffing. We had some additional contract reviewers that we brought on board last year towards the end of the year, and that really started to make a difference in January. Mr. Rimmelhoff, if I could pause for a question or comment from Councilmember Connell. Yes. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Never mind. So the, um, this slide shows, of the requests that we received in January, what type were they? The important thing, I think, from this slide is we've identified categories that can benefit from, those, from additional structure. So like the phase one cited assessment I use as an, as an example, we have another, a number of other categories that define how a request will be processed. The, the kind of undefined requests are just labeled general request here. They now only represent about half of the requests we've taken in. 
So for street cameras, I think there's another good example there. We have a defined process. We only have that data for a limited amount of time, so we needed to have a different workflow than you would have for, say, an email poll. Um, by defining that, people can request it through a form, the right people are immediately notified, and we can start to take action on that request. So one of the, so it's, it's a good thing that we have more categories, and I think we'll be breaking out more as the year goes on. But I think if you look in the, the position of the categories from the left to the right, many of them are still not as well defined as they could be. Um, so one of our goals this year will be moving more of these to more structured workflows. And I'll also note that uh, there are some uh, more low-hanging fruit in the general request category that we're working on ad uh, developing additional forms for. I think in the very next report we'll have uh, snow requests, snow removal uh, data, which has been a hot request lately. So as we see changes in requests, we'll break out more and more structures. So Mr. Rumohoff, on something like that, um, can you help me understand more? Um, are they looking, can you help this, help illuminate the nature of those kinds of requests? Are they looking at where the reporting happened, which I don't think is information that we'll give out? Um, is, are they looking for just the quantity of them across the city? Typically this is more um, linked to our, our, kind of like our inspection report. So here it's looking for uh, where um, the city removed it in the before and after photos. I see. So the, uh, the next slide, um, oh, and also note, the, the slides with the orange dots in the top right-hand side, these are slides which I think, we're, which we're currently planning on bringing back as part of the repeating um, uh, report to, to file, so that I wanted to draw your attention to those in case there's slides that you had either if we see something that's missing, we can add them, or if there's something that you don't find helpful, we can talk about that as well. So we receive requests from the public at, at large, but we receive about a quarter of our requests from businesses. Um, about another 10% or so are from law firms, and then about 10% are from the media. A handful are from other agencies, and then the public category listed here, it's, it's a mixture of the general public, um, organizations, or people who just didn't disclose or we weren't able to tell what, what other type of entity they were. Now, we're happy to re answer requests for anybody. The reason I think I wanted to show the slide is because when it's structured, a, a business structure is based on making requests and leveraging government data, I think there's more opportunity for us to work with that requester to uh, make sure that we can add workflow definition around the request. If it's something that's going to be more than a one-off, if it's something that we're going to provide, for example, on a, a monthly basis, there's an opportunity, I think, to simplify it, really understand what they need, what it's easy for us to give them, and make a more efficient process. The other thing I want to mention is a lot of my focus here is on efficiency with the requests, and that's because when we have so many requests, that we're, we're typically running into a backlog, efficiency helps transparency of the city because we're able to take some things off the table. If we can answer requests quickly, the staff can focus on other requests. So if we could take some of these business requests, make them into a defined process largely within the departments, my staff can focus on answering other requests to the public and media. Yeah, I have a couple questions on that, but first my colleague, Council Member Fletcher, has something. Thank you, Chair Paul Masano. Uh, so how connected is, uh, and I'll just, as, as a, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, as a bit of feedback, uh, defined workflow and no defined workflow and mixed feel uh, are confusing categories to me. I'm not sure what to do with that information yet. So we need to think about how to, uh, how to present that because I'm not 100% not sure what, what they really mean. Um, the... I am curious, how much are you working, how much is this connected to work with IT to create dashboards? And um, 
uh, particularly for data that's being requested monthly or being requested on a regular basis, how much can we automate that so that uh, we never even have to receive a request other than uh, somebody going to a website and, and pulling down the data for themselves? That's a great question, Madam Chair, uh, Councilman Fletcher. I think, so I, I think the, we, we're struggling with the category names um, ourselves. I'll, I'll flip backwards briefly to, to these specific workflows. Um, where they, what they really mean is when something comes in, a phase one site assessment, we know who receives those, we know what to do, we can assign timelines, we know what type of data we're looking for. Um, a general request, which is just as a you know, page of um, you know, text, we have to first discern and try to figure out where that data might be. But I'm going to go back to the phase one because that gets to your other point too. Once we've defined really a good definition of what people are looking for and where it sits, we can work with the departments to figure out how best to get it. Maybe this is designing with IT a Cognos report that pulls just the, the, the public data into a report so it's much easier to, to create. Um, for the phase one site assessment, actually regulatory services um, went forward with a dashboard showing their inspection data, inspection violation data. Uh, so that's on their website. So now when a requester is looking for a phase one site assessment, we're able to direct them to that. They can self-serve. We don't even need, they don't even need to make a request. Um, for other components like the paper documents, I mean, they'll still need to go through a request for that. But that is the goal. Um, and even with the paper documents, as I said, once we've identified that that was what's driving the timeline and responding to the requests, we were able to identify a solution of, let's put this in the queue for scanning, and then maybe we can put that online as well. That's a great point, thank you. Mr. Omohoff, a question I have about all of these businesses, which I didn't actually have an appreciation for how many of our data requests actually come from businesses until I got further into this and became a council member. Um, could you help me understand the public purpose in business requests, because it seems to me uh, or examples I have in my mind are things that businesses are using public resources to get information so that they can do better with their marketing of products. Uh, are there is there public purpose for businesses to have um, to be able to submit data requests? Uh, um, Chair Palmasana, so what I can say is uh, under the law they have the right to access the data. Um, I think you're right in that many of them are using data to target marketing. Um, we get some requests um, to identify people who might be interested in uh, uh, building fixtures, for example, based on permits. Um, but I think the public purpose argument is that to the extent that, that the government is accruing this, this data, uh, it's a public asset, and so that it should be able to be used by academics, businesses, anybody for whatever reason. Um, I, mean, I think I won't opine on you know, the value of that, but I think that's the underlying theory. And then as a, as a requester, you don't actually even have to identify what you want to do with the data or why. So we treat all requesters similarly. And really the only reason um, we broke it down to this category is because there is an opportunity to interact, I think, differently with repeat requesters. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that if a business, if it fits into more of a defined workflow or even better, as Councilmember Fletcher said, just something available online, that that would be an appropriate use. Um, but that seems strange to me is all. How about the timeliness of these kinds of requests, right? I know that a concern we get a lot from, uh, from whether private individuals or members of the media is that we're quite slow to turn things around, and is there an opportunity to get more efficient and things that are more timely versus not quite so integral as to turning it around quickly? Yeah, and I do have some some data on on kind of the how we're doing piece of things. Um, so I'll jump right to here. Um, I think one of the reasons we're focused on the the creating structure around types of requests is to improve the timeliness. The more we can say, the more we can define what, what the responsive data is and how we're going to get it, and the more we are ahead of, we're ahead of the game there, we can be efficient in, in responding, but we can also set expectations. So businesses know it takes about you know, 21 
30 days to close a phase one environmental, but they also know they're going to get most of their data much sooner than that. It's the paper data that's going to be the lagging, um, lagging release. Here I can say the average age is 46 days. Um, averages are kind of a tricky measure here. Uh, more than 30 close in 10 days, um, and then you can see the, the table yourself, about a half uh, get closed within the, a little bit more than half closed within the first 30 days. Um, one of the things we're hoping to do by creating definition around types of requests is for each type to set appropriate standards for that type. Um, it's always going to be hard to say how long a request should take if we can't say anything about it, because some requests can be for tens of thousands of emails. Um, some requests are for a single document. Uh, so, but by cate better categorizing these things, we'll be able to better measure how well we're doing. The, uh, I will say the average is similar to, uh, to years past, the 46 days, but part of that is um, driven by some, the backlog of kind of very old re requests. So I said we brought on additional contractors. Um, they were very helpful in moving some of those forward. And so as those close, they kind of shift the average a little bit. And so you are going to see that number bounce around month to month. So this shows kind of what I'm talking about in terms of if we can better define what we're trying to do, um, we can build processes around it. So we don't have a lot of defined processes yet. A lot of them are in that, that kind of a mixed group where we have some elements defined, but we're still working on, on getting everything as efficient as possible. Um, and again, these numbers are going to bounce around as well because some of the oldest requests are in that last category, which is kind of artificially bumping up the average higher than you'd, you'd expect. Um, I'll note on, the first, on this first presentation with one month's data, it's, it's going to be a little bit different. I think we're going to be able to do a little bit more uh, assessment as we're receiving and filing this uh, towards the end of the year, one year in, I think we'll have be able to do a pretty robust look. So the uh, before actually before moving to this, I will note that there are some additional metrics on the how are we doing that because of the small base sizes. We're not showing this time around, but I don't think we'll wait to the annual report for. So we're hoping to, over the next several months, add some some more in, and I can certainly take some uh, take suggestions. But the average time to complete the activity of retrieve, review, and release, and the percentage meeting the standards that we've set for that that type, are what we're hoping to add in. Um, the other thing I think it's important to add is the impact of requests on departments. Not every department receives requests equally. Some are really hard hit by these, and others receive only a handful a year. So showing how departments, which of these uh, kind of affect the departments as well. So the last thing I wanted to show um, here is the current open portfolio. I said current here, it means as on, on January 30, 31st. So after the efforts in January um, this year, what was left? And so we had 173 requests, which is a net reduction of more than 100 requests. Most of them were of that undefined type. And here's your age breakdown. So the uh, thing that jumps out to me on this slide is there are uh, 10 requests that are a year or older. And that, I think, is a bit eyebrow raising. For each of these, there's a story, um, and in some cases, it's because they're standing requests. I think those are those are requests that uh, you make and you continue to get data on a periodic basis. So, if I want every month the, uh, you know, the council committee, uh, well, that would be a bad request because it's publicly available. But if I wanted a monthly report that was uh, was coming in, you can make a standing request, and uh, uh, that that request would continue to exist indefinitely. Um, so I think one of the things we've learned, we need a better way of reporting and tracking those so they don't muddle up our data. But other requests here are, are single point requests for large batches of email. Um, most of those are in a rolling request status, so we're providing some data to the requester periodically. 
But even so, um, I think you'll agree that 10, 10 requests at more than a year old is a significant uh, number that are significantly, uh, well, it's an issue. So having this here in this report, I think will be helpful because the current open portfolio is where you'll see lagging requests. This will bring attention to the issue, it holds us accountable, and it helps us uh, uh, keep focus on solving this, these issues. So the other thing I'll say on this slide is uh, um, these numbers too will change month to month. So already a number of these requests more than a year old are closed. Um, I think when we're here next month with February's numbers, you'll see a, a little bit different story. So those are the, the metrics that we brought for this first time around. Certainly happy to get feedback on what's missing or what you'd like to see. Um, but I did want to say a few words about some of the additional factors that affect these. So we're doing this report today in response to a staff directive, but also because this is the first time we've had access to data um, like this. IT's been working with us to build a system, and we've been able to pull more information, standardize more information with the departments about how we're doing on, on these data requests. Um, in pulling this report together, one of the lessons I've learned is that we still have a bit of a long way to go to make sure the data is as easy to use as possible and as, as reportable as possible. Ultimately, we'd really like to see this as a dashboard, so you don't need to necessarily file a report. There's something that's available that you can see where things are. The, uh, the other thing I'll note is um, the staffing impact has been pretty, pretty important. We've had, uh, we have a vacancy now, but we had additional contract reviewers um, to help close the gap, and I think we'll be continuing to focus on the requests that are a year or older um, to try to, to remediate that issue. Um, so the, uh, I think it was a budget last year, council had provided some money for um, contract review, temporary reviews to help address data practice requests. I just want to say that has been a helpful helpful tool. Mr. Romohoff, I'm going to pause you there and, oh, wait. Uh, Council Member Fletcher, no? Sorry. And the, well, the, the last thing I was going to note is um, the next report is April, April 9th. It'll be shorter, we'll just more focus on the actual metrics. And one thing that we're hoping to have is, is um, MPD data in here as well. MPD receives their own requests. They did provide some data, but it was, um, things are tracked differently there. They're not yet in the same system as we are. And so it's been, it was a bit difficult to try to pull the similar metrics together from their data set. They did provide it, it's just, uh, it was so different that it'd be hard to tell a similar story, I think. Okay, then. So <laughs> thank you very thank you. much for your time mm -hmm. today. And uh, uh, certainly we'll, I'm happy to take any questions. Thoughts, questions, feedback for our data practices experts here in the room? I'm not seeing any. Mr. Clerk. Uh, Madam Chair, I wanted to say how much we appreciated this committee's direction to bring this report forward, but also to the team, Mr. Omohoff and his team, for pulling this data together. And he mentioned a few times, but just to emphasize that point, having the data not only allows us to share that with policymakers and its impact on the enterprise operation and will improve over time, but also to allow the public and policymakers to hold us accountable in our performance. And I recall back to when I began my service at the city in 2010, um, we actually traced every single one of our requests were noted on yellow post-it notes and posted on a wall in the order. And that was our tracking system. So today we actually have real systems and real tools to be able to track that data and produce these reports. Um, and it still feels often to the team that we don't have great tools, but I like to remind them frequently of where this came from, where we literally were tracking everyone's data practice requests on post-it notes, and that was not even a decade ago. So I appreciate the work of the team, and I appreciate the ability to bring these uh, reports to the committee. 
Thank you. All right. Well, with that, I will um, make a motion to receive and file this first report for the data practices request. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That carries with all of our business um, finished. We will adjourn. Thank you.